I have an office in my house where I do a lot of my work, but because I have 100 kids, sometimes I can't do it there. Um, and so I have to leave. And I go to coffee shops a lot, which is good because I, you know, I connect with a lot of different people at coffee shops. And then I also go to the library, uh, which is miserable, but I have to go there. Uh, I used to go to this one place, and uh, I had to stop going because I would go, and as the customers came in, the people who worked there would talk to them, you know, be able to play all nicey nicey. And then when they would leave, they would be like, rawr, 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 and just gripe at them. And I'd be like, man. And then the vendors would come, you know, bringing them the milk or whatever they needed. And then when they left, rawr, rawr. and I'm spending hours there a week. I mean, hours. And uh, all of a sudden it occurred to me, I wonder what they're saying about me when I leave. And so I, st- I stopped going. They, there, it's not that they did anything specific to offend me or anything like that. I just, I'm like, man, I really feel like I'm intruding on their business because I'm here. And uh, just the persistent griping and negativity and complaining just kind of ate at me. And so I, I haven't been there in a long time now. I go do my work elsewhere. And, you know, I'm sure they don't care. But uh, it, it kind of um, helps me think about some things as it relates to uh, the atmosphere that we create as a church. There's a, a guy named uh, Tom Rainer, who most of you don't know and don't care to know, but he writes a lot of books. Again, most of you don't care. But... He wrote this book last year called The Millennials. And what a millennial is, for those of you who are unaware of pop research, is anybody between the ages of 14 and 34. If you were born between 1980 and the year 2000, you are a millennial. Congratulations. Uh, But he wrote a book on the millennials. And one of the things he said was, this is a, a huge chunk of the American population, being roughly 80 million people. And in this chunk of 80 million people, about 15% of them claim to be Christian. So that means most people you know between the ages of 14 and 34 years old, three, only about 3 out of 20 of them are going to claim to be a Christian. That's a pretty staggering statistic in America. And then you think about the people younger than 14, and you think about the children of the millennials, and you think about the future of our country, and it's, it's decidedly unchristian and non-Christian because of this. Unless uh, something major changes, something major happens, um, we're basically one generation away from b- having no uh, Christian interaction in our culture and in our society. It's very different from, say, even one generation ago. Uh, and uh, anyway, he writes this, this book about this, uh, this age group, and he says these things. And there's a lot of reasons why these people are disconnected from churches, why they're disconnected from the message of the gospel. Uh, one of the, the things, though, he points out is they're not nearly as put off uh, by the doctrinal and, and theological beliefs of Christianity as they are by the attitude of most people in the church. Which is strange, because you would think the first thing for a lot of people would be, what does this place believe? And, and that would attract them or, or cause them to disengage. But for this age group, the average person in this age group, one of the highest values they have is the values of unity and respect. Now, this is the, the generation of people that came up with Twitter and Facebook. They see the value of corroboration and interconnection of relationship. Even if, if, even if it's a superficial relationship, there's still a value to this. Uh, they, they, there are certain maxims that they go by. Things like if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go farther, you go together. The, the value of mutual respect, of partnership together is, is high in this. And so when people, the average person from this age group goes into a church and they see disrespect and they see disunity, they have a reaction similar to what I had with that business. If these people are like this when I'm here, what are they like when I'm not here? And there's a, just a disengagement. And when most people go to church, it's difficult enough to go to a church uh, if you've never been before particularly. It's, it's also very difficult to go to a church that, uh, that is not a church you're accustomed to. And so if you go into that environment and then you find a, a general attitude of disrespect or fighting or disunity, it's very off-putting, and most people aren't going to go back. That's just the way it is. Most people aren't going to give that kind of environment a second chance. And so I find it funny that he wrote an entire book about this kind of stuff, uh, but <laughs> this, uh, this experience is a very por- important one when we get to the church. The, the message of the gospel has some very offensive components to it. This idea that that God would reject us because of our sin can be very offensive to many people. And the, the thought that we might be under God's wrath because of stuff that we've done is, is a very difficult thing to swallow for most people. 
And then you add to that potentially offensive message an attitude that can be divisive, an attitude that can be complaining or, or disrespectful. And, uh, and it's no wonder that so many people don't want to be part of the church. And I don't see these things in our church, fortunately. If, if I did, I think I would address them personally. So that's a warning to you. But, um, but I think there's still value in approaching these things on a Sunday morning. At, you know, it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But it's good to fix it before it gets broke, too. Uh, and when we, when we look at, or when we, <laughs> when I read random books like this and see these things, sometimes it's, it's comical to me because I understand the, the value of research and statistical analysis and those kinds of things, but I also understand that they're deficient in a lot of ways. And this guy wrote this entire book about this stuff when, in a lot of ways, you can look at it with common sense. You know, like if I'm going to a restaurant or an establishment, if you will, and these people are griping about everybody that walks in the place, I'm just not going to go back. It's common sense. If, if you walk into a church and the people are rude and disrespectful and fighting each other, you're not going back. That's common sense. But this guy wrote a book about it showing that not only is it common sense, there's statistical analysis for this. And then it's funny to me, too, because when you open the pages of Scripture, you see this in the Scripture. So it's not anything that's new to the church. Jesus told his followers, they will know you by your love for one another. And the reason he has to say this kind of thing is because we don't naturally do this. This is not natural for us. We're we're naturally disagreeable to one another. Uh, We we like the people we like, and we certainly don't like the people we don't like. And uh, another place he says, you know, how easy is it for you to love people who already love you? Try loving people who hate you. And, uh, and so the, the nature of the gospel is very different when it comes to this kind of attitude because our desire is to reciprocate love that we are given, not to reciprocate love from hate that we are given. Uh, when, and when people uh, uh, gripe to us or complain about us, uh, we're not quick to forgive most of the time. And, and yet in the pages of Scripture and the teaching of Jesus and of his, of his apostles, we see uh, many places, one we're going to look at today, about unity in the church, about how to get along with people who it's difficult to get along with. How do we work with people who are imperfect? How do we love people who sin against us? And there's a word called unity that is used in a lot of different ways culturally, but it's it's a very important word scripturally, and and hopefully today we're going to grow in our understanding of this. Uh, Even though, again, in my opinion, this isn't a major issue in our church, uh, it's, it's good to head it off at the past to see if there's any attitudes or actions in us that need to be repented of, that need to, to be approached. Um, if we're serious at all about proclaiming the gospel to the people in our lives, if we've come to believe the gospel and are convinced of its, of its goodness and of its truth, and therefore the desire to see other people believe this message, if this is an important thing in our lives, then we have to uh, at least approach it in a, in a position where we understand that it can be offensive, And so we need to not be offensive in our presentation of it. We need to understand that many people are put off by the message, so we have to be very careful not to put them off by our attitudes or by our complaining or by our disrespect. But in the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul devotes the whole chapter of chapter 4 to this issue of unity in the church, getting everybody on the same page, keeping us all as a church on the same page. And we're going to spend this week and next week looking at different aspects of it. It gives us this comprehensive approach on how unity should work in the church. He talks about the virtues or the behaviors that promote it. This, the, then he gives us a confession or a doctrinal beliefs that ground it. He gives us gifts that build unity. And then he finishes the chap, chapter 4 with the goal of what is unity for? What is it about? And so let's look at these first two today. We'll begin reading verses 1 through 3. <laughs> As we uh, see the virtues that promote unity, he says, I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So again, he starts off reminding us that he's in prison. The things that he's teaching here are not something that he isn't paying for with his own life. These are very serious truths, and because he proclaims these things, it's causing him to reside in a Roman prison. He's writing these things to a church who's in in great need of instruction on how the gospel is supposed to work in their context, and it's such a serious issue that he takes takes the time from a prison cell uh, 
to write these things. And so it's, it's a, there's a, a gravity to this. There's weight to this message that he's saying. But he says the basic way here that we promote unity within the church is to walk worthy of our calling. To be worthy of that which we've been called to, namely Christ. And this word walk is used figuratively, of course, and it points to the way in which we live our lives, the general direction of our lives. To walk worthy is to accept God's plan for our lives, but then also to align our lives so that his plan is seen in the everyday course of our lives. It's, it's one thing to walk the walk. It's another thing to, to talk the talk, right? And, it, it, and Paul is saying these two things have to be joined together. If you're going to say these things are true, then it needs to be reflected in the way you live your life. And, and this is of the very uh, most basic nature of how the gospel begins to apply in all the situations and relationships of our lives. If we say Jesus did these things, if we say Jesus is God in the flesh, having died for us, rising again, and one day coming again to establish his kingdom, if we say these things are true, then the nature of our lives changes. The, the behavior changes. The, the things we engage ourselves in changes because there's a, 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 a sacrificial component that comes into play. There's an ultimate destination component that comes into play. All the different facets of what makes the gospel the gospel have different ways of applying in our lives and in our church. And Paul and the other New Testament writers go to great lengths throughout the New Testament to show how these things work, not just individually, but as a collective in the church. And so he starts out saying, when we walk worthy of this calling, there's some behaviors, there's some virtues that are a great place to start. And we'll get over these, uh, we'll get there over the next couple of weeks, over the next couple of chapters. He goes into lots of detail. But here he starts in verse 2 with a list that's by no means exhaustive, but an excellent place to start nonetheless. And he says that if we're going to walk worthy of the calling of Christ, we need to grow in humility. We need to grow in gentleness and in patience, and then our ability to bear with one another lovingly. Now, that's not an exhaustive list, but I think probably for most of us, if we could get that down, (laughs) there would be a huge change in our lives. If we could learn to be humble, if we could learn to be gentle, and that that word can have a different connotation in your mind, so I'll explain it here in a second. But if we can learn some of these things, just these few things here, uh, the course of our lives will change radically. And so there's an understanding of the gospel who Jesus is, what Jesus has done for us, and one day what he will do for us, what he is doing for us now by the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And these behaviors are components of that. And so it's not like he's saying, learn to be humble, and then you'll, you'll reflect Christ. He's saying, when we reflect Christ, we'll learn to be humble. There's, you got to keep the cart and the horse in the proper positions. The, the horse is first, right? You don't put the cart first, so it dumps over and the potatoes go everywhere. But this is what Paul is saying. There's, yeah, potatoes. Uh, there's a way to do these things. It's not moralism. He's not saying if you learn to live properly, God will accept you. That's not what he's saying. There's a, there's a miscommunication in many religions about this. If we learn to live the right way, God might accept us. That's not Christianity, and that's not what Paul is saying here. You don't find that message in the New Testament. What he's saying here is because of the calling that God has on our lives, the people that he's making us, these things should be reflected. And it's good to identify these things because often we can see when they're not present in either, either in our lives or the lives of other people. We see when a person or when, our, when we ourselves are not humble or when we're not gentle, when we, when we don't practice patience and when we don't bear with other people in love. We, we see when these things don't happen. And so he's saying when we understand the gospel, when we grow in Christ, these things become part of our lives. Humility is, of course, putting others before ourselves. In this context, though, it has a lot more to do with what we say than necessarily what we do. And so we talk about other people. We talk about uh, the qualities we see in other people more than we talk about our own qualities, is what he's saying. We have a habit of of talking about ourselves, or do we have a habit of talking about other people in a positive way? And he's saying humility is a a heart desire where we recognize the value and worth of other people, and that comes out in the way we speak. And then gentleness, he adds to that. They're they're kind of two sides of the same coin. Gentleness, in other contexts, is also translated humility. But here he's talking about uh, what we do and our actions, where we assert ourselves or don't assert ourselves. Humility is a way of either asserting ourselves properly or refusing to assert ourselves improperly. And so these two things work together. In the way we present ourselves in a crowd, namely the church, 
when we walk into the church and with the words we say, what, what kind of attitude and presence exudes us? Paul is saying a person who is living worthy of the calling that Christ has on their lives, when they enter a room, there's an air of humility. There, there's an air of, of putting others before ourselves. And this is something that the Spirit of God works within us naturally. And it's a great thing to see in the lives of other people. Then he takes the other two things, patience and bearing with one another. These are kind of the opposite. These are responsive. And so he's saying when you walk into a room, it should be a, a, an attitude of humility, an attitude of otherness rather than self being presented. But then he says when you're already in that room and somebody walks in the door and they're presenting themselves first and out of their mouths comes all kinds of stuff about themselves, he's saying your reaction to that is to be what? Patient and bearing with them. And so you see the two sides. It's, it's me presenting myself and then also me reacting to each of you. And it's you presenting yourselves and then reacting to me. And so when I come across in an arrogant manner, you're patient with me and you bear with me in love, right? That last word there is the kicker, love. That's the, the overarching virtue in all of New Testament ethics and behaviors. Love rules the day. And here he says the reason why we would present ourselves this way the reason why we would respond to others who don't present themselves that way is because of the love that God has for us in Jesus Christ. And that causes us to begin to live differently. And so these virtues, these values, these behaviors grow in our lives. And so over the course of the months and years of our lives, as we follow Christ, we grow in humility. We grow in, in gentleness or in in, in both our, our humility in action and our humility in words. We grow in our ability to respond to people who aren't humble in a more Christ-like manner. And Paul is saying these things are the basic virtues of what it means to maintain unity in the church. Because there are going to be times when you and I present ourselves arrogantly. You and I come into a room with great pride in self rather than pride in Christ. We're going to think we've accomplished something in regards to our spiritual condition. We've managed to avoid a certain sin or we've managed to, to do a, a certain righteous act and we're going to present ourselves in a way that we're looking for praise from other people. But Paul is saying when that happens, not only do we need to repent because it's divisive to the church, but also the church needs to respond with patience and with bearing with us, being, being supportive of us even though we're not exactly living or acting the way we should. And uh, this is what it means to walk worthy of this calling, to know what Christ has done for us and to respond in our lives properly. When others annoy us because of their sin, uh, we're patient with them. Uh, when we annoy others because of our sin, uh, we learn humility, we learn gentleness, we learn how to present ourselves properly. And these things take time. We all go through uh, experiences and phases that either cause us to be more arrogant or cause us to be more humble. And all of us at various points in life are going to err on one side or the other. And so these are behaviors that are learned, but they're not learned by ourselves. If you spend enough time by yourself, you're going to be very arrogant. Uh, part of being in community as the church is to learn humility, not for humility's sake, but for Christ's sake. Because when we're able to live humbly, it teaches us something about who Christ is and what Christ has done for us. And so he gives us these virtues, these behaviors that, that uh, are for unity, but then he also shows us that these things are to facilitate the work of God's Spirit in the church. In verse 3, it's the Spirit that creates unity in the church. There's a common recognition of what God is doing in the church, and so we're brought together in unity because of this, both in, in a confessional standpoint and in a responsive standpoint. It says he brings us together in the bond of peace. This is the bond that God creates between us and him, because there, we're no longer enemies with God because of our sin. He's reconciled us to himself. We don't have to worry if he accepts us. He's made peace between us and him in Jesus Christ. But then there's also this bond of peace between one another. God has bridged this gap between us so that there's more that brings us together than divides us because of Christ. And when we have the issues of sin between us, the bond of peace causes us to, to continue along in relationship, to, to continue to look for restoration and repentance because, and forgiveness because we've been reconciled to God, both of us. When both sides are reconciled to God, we know that we're going to spend eternity together, so we may as well figure it out now. And, uh, and this bond of peace is built as we learn 
to be patient with one another, to bear with one another because of what Christ has done for us. Certainly he's been patient with us. Certainly he's, he's uh, brought forgiveness to us. And in, way back in chapter 2, those of you who, who are here will remember at one point, talking about Jesus, Paul says he is our peace. It's Jesus himself that is our peace. And so as we respond to the, to the work that he's done in our lives individually, the collective response then, the response of the church, is to find peace with one another, to, to not let divisive things come in, to not let uh, sin enter in and, and cause division in the church, but rather to continue to seek reconciliation because of what Jesus has done. We don't have to hold grudges. We don't have to hold sin against one another because Jesus has forgiven it, and so we can learn to forgive it as well. And so there's this bond of peace between us and God because of Christ. There's also a bond of peace between fellow believers because God has reconciled us both in Christ. And now peace is a lack of conflict, but it's also the way that God designed life to work. This word peace means a big picture. It's not just that there's no longer war. It's things are ordered properly. Life is lived properly. And as we personally grow in our walking worthy of Christ, walking worthy of our calling, we grow together in the church, and we learn to live together in this way of peace, how God designed life to work, the community of Christ, the kingdom of God, people living properly together with love as the law. This peace that rules over us is, is to be an example to the whole world looking on, that when we learn to forgive one another and bear with one another, even though we're very, very different in the church, it's, it's a testimony to an onlooking world what Christ has done for us in bringing us peace. The church is, is supposed to be a microcosm of the life God intended his people to live and the life that God will one day bring to all of us. But Christianity can't be lived in a vacuum. It takes us. It's an us religion, not an I religion. We need to come together as the church. And if we stop pursuing Christ, it affects the whole church body. It opens up an opportunity for spiritual damage and division if one person in the body stops walking worthy or, or decides to not walk worthy of the calling that we have. But when we come together and we pursue this, the growth and the great things that God does in us is staggering. And so if, if one of those things isn't enough to convince us to pursue Christ, hopefully the other one is. It's not just me by myself walking worthy of Christ. It's us walking worthy of Christ together. It takes us both. It takes us all. Christianity isn't a religion for people to live alone. We need to live it in community. And so let's encourage one another to grow in these ways. Um, it's, it's, of course, when somebody else is arrogant, it's very easy just to point out their arrogance. Uh, and, and there may be a time and a place for that. But those things also need to happen in the context of relationship. People you don't know don't like you pointing out their sin. Uh, if you don't know me, don't come up to me and tell me I'm a glutton. All right? You don't know me. Let's talk. Let's have coffee. Let's, let's, you can buy me a piece of pie, and then we'll talk about it. But uh, there's, there's, uh, there's a point, not just in our culture, but within the church, where we have accountability and we have judging. And the way to bridge that gap is through relationship. And when we truly know one another, as, as Paul is commending here, that we have this bond of peace because of the love of Christ, that it opens up our relationships so that we can then speak this truth into one another's lives so that we move on, we move to that higher plane of living, that, that next way of life that God is calling us to. And so we begin to, uh, to help one another nourish and facilitate that new life that God is calling us to. But it happens in the context of relationship. Let's encourage one another in these ways. In, in the next few verses... In verses 4 through 6, after he gives us these basic virtues that promote unity in the church, in verses 4 through 6, he gives us a confession that grounds unity in the church, or, or doctrinal beliefs, a statement of doctrinal matters that ground the unity of the church. Christianity is grounded upon common beliefs, uh, and he mentions many of these things here. <laughs> he says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. There's some scholars that believe this was a type of confession that when early in the early church, when believers would go to be baptized, this is a statement that they would make. Uh, 
that I believe these things. And so that makes me doctrinally aligned with the church. Therefore, I can now go through the waters of baptism to become physically aligned with the church. But what he's showing here is that as the Spirit applies the peace of Christ to the church in unity amongst us, he also binds us together by leading us into God's truth. The peace of Christ is applied to our relationships in the, ch- in, the, in the church, but then the Holy Spirit also leads us into the same truth in the church. There's behavioral and there's doctrinal matters that we need to be unified on. And Paul gives us a great example of these things. Uh, we're bound together in the actions of love, but we're also bound together in the doctrine of truth. And so he gives seven components of doctrine. Seven. That's a lot. But he grounds us on these things. And believe it or not, this is pretty minimalist. Uh, this is a, a very small cross-section of, of Christian doctrine. Um, so whether or not this was like an early Christian confession that Paul then adopts and, and presents as, as valuable for instruction, or if he creates this and then it's later adopted, it, it's still of great value to us. And there's a component of unity here that Christians everywhere should be able to agree on these things. And let's, let's just go through them real quick. He says that there's one body. Here he's referring to the body of Christ, the church. And he spent the last couple of chapters talking about how Jews and non-Jews were divided in the church, and now because of Christ, they need to come together. And so when he says that there's one body, he's talking about whatever race you're from, whatever country you're from, whatever your background is, anyone who comes to Christ is made part of this one body. And Christians have always believed that although there are different expressions of the church, although there are different local gatherings of the church, there's one universal church, and it's the body of Christ. Uh, it's been in the early confessions, like the Apostles' Creed, it's called the Holy Catholic Church, and it's Catholic with a big C which means universal, not the denomination Catholic, but all Christians everywhere who come to Christ are part of this one body known as the church. Then he says there's one spirit. He's obviously talking about the Holy Spirit here. He indwells believers. He fills the church. He, as we've already talked about, he leads the, tr- the church in unity because of the, the bond of peace that Christ has given us. He also leads the church in truth, in doctrinal matters. He, he's given to us at the moment of salvation in the church as his temple where he resides. There's one spirit. There's one hope. We have one hope in Christ. Apart from Jesus, there's no reason why we would expect to have forgiveness or resurrection or or anything else in him. But in him and only in him do we have hope. And so when we're called to repent of our sin, to turn from our sin, to believe in Jesus, from that moment onward, we're filled with this one hope that we have in Christ. And related to that is the fourth thing. We have one Lord. Jesus is Lord. And the early church, to say that Jesus was Lord was treason because there was one other man who claimed to be Lord. His name was Caesar. And so many Christians who made this confession, Jesus is Lord, uh, paid for it with their lives in martyrdom. There's one Lord, Jesus Christ. There's one faith. Faith in Christ alone can bring us access to God and salvation. There's one baptism. Uh, this, even though it says there's one baptism, people interpret it different ways. But there's still one baptism because this is what the Apostle Paul says. Uh, So some people say this is spirit baptism. In other words, this is when we come to Christ, when we accept the forgiveness and the gospel, uh, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And some people say this is what it's talking about. Others, and this is where I fall, believe that he's talking about the purpose of baptism. We're baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We're, we're, there's one baptism as an entry into the church. When we're baptized, we, in, we become part of the church. It's the entry right. And so we make our confession of Jesus' lordship in our lives, and then the baptism ceremony demonstrates that, and we're joined to the church. And then finally, he says there's one God. In the New Testament world, there were claims to be many gods. Again, Caesar himself claimed to be God. And even in our day, there are other religions, religions like Hinduism, that claim to have many gods. But Christianity is very different. We claim one God, who we know in three persons, God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Spirit. And then in the the last part of that verse, he he shows in this statement the, the threefold personhood of God. He says, who is over all and through all and in all. One God and three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. And so he gives us these seven doctrinal matters. And he says, not only should there be behavioral unity in the church, because you bear with one another, you practice patience with one another, you you live humbly with one another. But in the church, there's also some doctrinal unity. There are things that we need to agree on. And he gives us a a slew of things here. 
there's uh, a lot of different ways that people would describe these things. And there's certainly more doctrinal components that we probably should agree on. But Paul is showing here that in the earliest form of Christianity, there is even unity in diversity. He, he goes on and, uh, and talks about more of these things, and we'll get there next week. But in the, in the early church, the, this confession, Jesus is Lord, was the, the first tier confession. And then after it came things like this, to deny these things is to no longer be a Christian. And so even though there might be a lot of discussion and argumentation about what these things are, what these things mean, all Christians everywhere can come together and agree on these things, these matters. Uh, One of the main aspects of this is its exclusivity. Uh, Before each one of these seven things is the number one. And this is what, and it probably has always made Christianity difficult in this regard. But in our day and age, this is a very difficult thing. And for me personally, this is a very difficult thing. That when we affirm the truth of Christianity, when we affirm Christ's lordship in our lives, when we affirm that there's one God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, then by nature, all other religions are excluded. If there's one truth, then all other truths then become false truths. If there's one faith... All other faiths then become false faiths. If there's one hope, then all other hopes are false hopes. If there's one Lord, then there are no other lords. And so even though Christianity is very open when it comes to anyone, no matter your background, no matter your beginnings, your race, your country, anything, it's open to anyone who would come to Christ. It's also very exclusive because it requires everyone to come to Christ. And so Paul lists these seven things here, and we would, we, you know, we might go around and around about what he means by different things about the body and about the baptism and those kinds of things. But he continually affirms that there is one. And there's other places in the New Testament that affirm these things. And this is a very difficult thing in our culture and in our day. Because to say that Christ is the only way, as he does in John chapter 14, is to be viewed as very bigoted and very unloving and very narrow-minded um, and very hate-filled. But I'm, conv- <laughs> I'm convinced of the oneness of the Christian way. Uh, I see no other way. If, there, if Christ is one Lord, then there, are, there can be no other Lords. And there's, there's some, some different ways to approach this. You know, there are people that say there are many gods. Well, if Christ is God, then uh, there can't be other gods. If there are many ways and Christ says he's the only way, then there can't be many ways. So to affirm Christianity is to, uh, by default, uh, deny every other way, deny every other religion, and and proclaim all other truths as not ultimate, but false. Uh, Christianity is difficult in this way. As I start out mentioning, Christianity can be offensive enough in its basic message, in its basic component of, of doctrinal beliefs. To affirm Christ is to deny everything else, because Christianity is vastly different from the other world religions. It's even in these uh, seven simple things that Paul lays out here, it's very different from Islam and Judaism and Hinduism and Buddhism, just in these things. And so this is something that we all have to come to terms with. And I know it's a difficult thing because of what it means by default. To affirm Christ is to deny everything else. Uh, and that's a very difficult thing. Uh, but God presents himself in this way all throughout the scriptures. Even in the Old Testament, the the Jews were continually uh, called to worship their one God. This has always been the way of God's people. That there's lots of temptation to look to other religions and look to other gods and try to accept these things. But there's a continual calling to affirm the one God and the one way. And it doesn't make it easy, it doesn't make it fun or or even nice. Uh, But I'm convinced of its truth. I'm convinced that, uh, that Jesus is the only way. And, and as difficult as it is, um, th- therefore I have to deny that other ways uh, ultimately lead to God. There's, it's self-defeating to affirm that. We can't, we can't do both. You can't have it both ways. And so as we look at our lives, it, it, it then draws us to a certain conclusion. If we affirm Christ and his lordship, then that means most people are living in falsehood. Most people are living in darkness apart from Christ. 
and that's a difficult thing to think about. It, it haunts me. Um, and this is why I find great hope in the providence of God, because he's put people in my life, he's put people in your life, uh, and given us a responsibility to make sure they have the gospel available to them. Um, this is why we started a church. If these things aren't true, then there's no need to have another church. I mean, this, the purpose of the church is to make sure people have an opportunity to hear the gospel. Because all of us, all people everywhere are in desperate, desperate need of it. And it doesn't put us on a higher moral plane because we've come to the knowledge of it. It just means that there's poison in our blood and we found an antidote. And we need to share that. So who is it in your life that God has placed there and entrusted to you to make sure they have access to the gospel? As a church, we partner with missionaries and we're continuing to do that to make sure we're doing as much as we can worldwide to proclaim this message to people who haven't had access to it. But we do this here too. In just the way we generally live our lives, the people we work with and our neighbors and the people we interact with at restaurants and different places throughout the week. And God in his providence brings people into our lives so that we would have an opportunity to present the gospel to them. Uh, this takes relationship. It takes quiet service and action. It takes persistent prayer. But it also takes bold statements for people to know their need for Jesus. And who is this in your life? Who has God placed in your life that needs to know Christ? It's too an important matter to not do, even if we run the risk of being accused of being narrow-minded or bigoted or any of those things or judgmental. Uh, there's a way to do it in the context of relationship where it minimizes those things. Uh, but we, we've been entrusted with this message. And part of walking worthy of our calling is making sure the people that God has brought into our lives by his providence have an opportunity to hear this message. So who is it that you're praying for? Who is it that you're serving? Who is it that you speak the gospel to? We all have those people in our lives. And, uh, and God has called us to share the gospel with them. Maybe as I've been talking this morning uh, and you, you're thinking through these things, you've realized that you've never confessed Jesus as your Lord. Maybe you've never come to a point in your life where you've asked God to forgive you because of what Christ has done and, and, and sought to be reconciled with him, to find that peace that God offers us in Jesus Christ. And today I would extend that offer to you to hear the gospel that Jesus has forgiven us because of his work is one thing, but it's something completely different to actually receive the gospel and let that truth come into your life. And so if you've never done that, I encourage you to open your heart to the things of God this morning. Would you pray with me? If you've never asked Jesus to come into your life and to be your Lord, uh, it's as simple as, as speaking a simple prayer to God and, and saying, God, I've done things my own ways long enough. I realize my need for you, and I want to open my heart to you today. Please be my Lord and forgive me. And lead me into life with you. Help me to walk worthy of this calling to which you've called me. I'd love to talk more about, you, uh, more about that with you if, uh, if you'd like. I'm available afterward or by, you can even call me or email me and we can get together. But don't put this decision off. Maybe it's the only reason God brought you here today. So that you would hear this message of the gospel and respond to it in obedience and make Christ your Lord and live life with him forever. For the rest of us, there's, uh, there's people in our lives that God has placed there. And we have opportunities to be uh, the mouthpiece of God and speak the gospel into their lives. We pray for boldness in those relationships and pray for those people to turn to Christ. And Father, we thank you for your word given to us. Thank you, Lord, that you give us instruction on how we're to live before you, that we're to walk in humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love. We know when we don't walk this way. So God, help us to respond to you obediently, knowing you're leading us into a better way of life in Christ. And God, as we have opportunity to speak the gospel to our friends and neighbors and coworkers and the other people you bring into our lives, help us to be obedient in that regard too. 
and call people to a knowledge of Christ. Call people to this gospel that you've shared with us by your grace and your mercy. Uh, Lord, work in our lives, work in our church. Bring unity where there is division. Bring peace where there is conflict. And work this new life within us, even today. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our benediction is found in Acts chapter 4. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means... By what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated, common men. They were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Our message can be offensive. It can be a difficult thing to proclaim. But people know if we've been with Jesus. People know if our hearts are right with God. It's obvious. People know this. Just like in the context of scriptures, these people were proclaiming that the people standing before them had crucified Christ. They had actually, not figuratively, actually crucified Christ. A very offensive thing to say to, to the rulers of their people. But what, what is their response? They're amazed because they knew that these men had been with Christ. The, the nature of unity in the church is all based on this. Have you been with Christ? The, the way that we know we can respond to one another properly is by making sure we've been with Christ, that we know him personally. Do you know him today? I pray that you do, and that we walk together worthy of his name. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Good to see everybody. Hope to see you next week.